Howdy, and welcome to the Where to Hunt podcast, the podcast that connects public land hunting enthusiasts. My name is Eric, I'll be your host, and this is episode two for Monday, October 14th. really just want to start out today by, uh, hopefully everyone's doing great, everyone's been enjoying the season. Uh, I know I haven't been out as much as I'd like due to time constraints and other uh, obligations, and the time I have had to get out has been unseasonably warm, I feel, so luckily or or hopefully the temperatures are dropping as i notice in the weather today looks like we're gonna have some consistent temperatures around the 50 degree mark for the rest of this week at least um i did also come across an article this morning from the wisconsin dnr and real quick nothing nothing real special here but just was curious uh for any of you listeners out there that might know more about uh the dnr public meetings that they hold and they just released a news article talking about Act 20, um, which directs Natural Resource Board to make at least 10,000 acres of land available for sale by June 30th of 2017. Again, no no big deal, but it did pertain to obviously the show and uh, what Where to Hunt stands for, which is, uh, you know, being enthusiastic about hunting public land. So what I also wanted to get into today is our topic of discussion for the week. And this week's topic of discussion is going to be hunting homework and you know what uh what do you do to scout for for land furthermore what do you do to scout for the deer once you find that land what steps are you taking uh what are you doing too much of too little of things like that and to go over that topic we did interview um a guest of the week and what i'll do is get into that interview after the interview if you want to stick around i'm going to go over some of the things the fans had to say over the last week or two and and um, give you a way to contact us if you have any comments, concerns, and things of that nature. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring our guest on. All right. Well, we're going to welcome Brian Perizzo of Custom Land Game Services LLC to the show. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. How are you? Doing pretty good, and uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day and taking time out of the woods to talk with us. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I'll let you kind of uh, introduce yourself and, and your business, give some some of the fans a taste of what it is you do and why you do it. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm the owner of Custom Game Land Services, LLC. Um, we uh, specialize in... in uh, um, wildlife management and habitat production. Um, basically what we do is uh, work a lot with a lot of private landowners. Um, we do a lot of work with um, the DNR uh, as well as real estate companies working towards getting uh, properties set up and properly managed for uh, all sorts of wildlife, not just uh, deer or turkey in general, but for the broad spectrum of wildlife uh, Basically, our goal is to uh, pr- provide the correct habitat and nutrition uh, t- to create the number one spot that wildlife would prefer and the, the, the place that wildlife really thrives. Um, and if, if, you, if we use one, uh, one example like whitetail, uh, we generally beef up a bedding area and then, you know, uh, majorly uh, improve food sources um, to gain, you know, better nutrition, um, better cover areas uh, to get these these animals to uh, a quality level that meets the standards that we we shoot for. Um, so really, that's that's really what the the company base is on. And uh, you know, like I say, we work with a lot of private landowners. The, the average person. Uh, not like we're an expensive service, but uh, you can you can give us a call and chit chat, and we can talk over different things. And uh, you know, people uh, people a lot of times call us just to just to have us out and walk the property with them. Uh, but that's uh, that's kind of the gist of, of the business. And where can people find you if they wanted to get in touch with you? Um, we have a, 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 we have a website, um, and we also have a Facebook page. Um, if you go to the Facebook page, it's Custom Game Land Services, LLC. And uh, if you go to that, you can also find our website. Awesome, awesome. Do you want to share your phone number, too? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, the number is 608-212-4622. Um, we are 
based out of South Central Wisconsin, uh, but we are an entirely statewide uh, company. So, um, and we do also get into the fringes of uh, the other parts of the Midwest, uh, like the UP, uh, Northern Illinois, Western or uh, Eastern Minnesota. Uh, we do get into those states a few a few times, just not real real often. I try to stick to to my home state, uh, which is where my passion is anyway. And how long have you been doing this for? Uh, roughly, uh, altogether, um, I, I, I would say about 15 years is, is what I've been doing it together, altogether for. Um, I, I started this company uh, seven years ago um, with the idea of just uh, keeping it kind of small time and um, just helping people that I knew uh, and that, you know, people that knew about me doing this. I just thought those would be the, the general uh, people I'd be working with. And it grew from there. Uh, so about seven years ago, uh, like I said, when I started the LLC in this company, uh, I wasn't expecting much out of this. But uh, over the last seven years, we've really grown, and uh, you know, it's led me to where we are now. That's pretty exciting stuff. It sounds like you keep yourself pretty busy with that, and there's a lot that goes in. There's a lot of aspects that I would never even think to consider. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, the, the one of the reasons um, that I wanted to highlight or bring to the surface uh, is I'm aware of it and I want to make the audience aware of it then as well is that it would seem to me that your your business uh, does does well with the private land um, portion of hunting and then managing that uh, habitat and those lands for those people but I find it particularly interesting that you mentioned that you hunt public land yep I absolutely do and uh, you know if you if it's like this. For me, it's like this, okay? Um, over the years, I had lots and lots and lots of private land to hunt on. And uh, I've got nothing against private land hunters, nothing against them whatsoever. Although, it got to be uh, to where I was managing uh, roughly 2,000 acres of my own private land that I had, you know, pretty much specifically for myself. And on that ground, uh, we were producing, I want to say, you know, four or five bucks that were Boone and Crockett and a couple of them that were tipping the scales around 200 inches. Um, And it got to be one of those things where it was the same thing year after year after year after year. Put it in the food plots, you do the mineral sites, you do the cameras, um, and then you know, season comes around and you just, you've got, already got the tree stand set, you know, they've been set for how many years on these properties you've been managing and all you did was go out and sit in them. And, uh, to me, it just, eventually it got to be kind of a routine and it just, it it didn't, it didn't quite do, do it for me. So it wasn't, it wasn't exciting you. Exactly. It got to a point where, you know, yeah, I mean, it was great to see, you know, monster deer of that caliber, but, you know. It was kind of expected at that point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it really was. It just didn't, it just didn't tip, you know, just didn't tip my trigger the way I wanted it to anymore. And then uh, I got kind of forced into this situation a little bit uh, because um, eventually I I ended up losing, um, I would say about half of my acreage all in one year. Um, for whatever reason, landowners uh, wanted to hunt it themselves now. All of a sudden, we had these monster deer there, and then they pretty much said, well, you know, thanks for doing the work, but see you later. Um, you know, and, and that, that really, you know, that really hurts a guy. Because uh, then you start going through the phases of, well, where am I going to hunt? Where am I going to do this stuff? Where am I going to set up these properties? Um, you know, and then it, it's just a lot of stress. Um, and, and you don't get that with public land. You don't. Um, you, you know, the public land is, is going to be there. It's going to be available. It's available to everyone. Uh, you don't have to worry about the DNR selling it because chances are they're going to own it forever and ever and ever. Um, and, you know, you, you've got access to that property all the time. Um and, yeah, I mean, when you really start looking at it, um, the Wisconsin DNR, and I, I can vouch for this, they do a great job at managing their properties. Um, 
as far as nutrition goes, you know, you really, you really got to look around and, and find those spots that have good food sources near them. But uh, for the most part, the DNR does a great job of managing it. And, um, you know, they have some of the best bedding and cover areas around. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're in a situation like I was where you had, you know, thousands of acres and then you got cut back to only a couple hundred acres, and now you're, you're frustrated, you're disappointed, uh, you pulled all your stands, and now you don't know what to do. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, the best choice I've ever made in my life, I think, was switching to hunting public land. Um, there's just so many opportunities out there that are overlooked by everybody that uh, I think is really kind of hurting people uh, as far as being uh, successful hunters. I really do. I like I like how you kind of said all that. Um, and, and you're right, I don't have anything against private land owners either, by all means. Um, but I, I can kind of see what you're saying with the routine, and it gets a little lackadaisical, and you come to expect that you're going to see that big buck every time, or you should, uh, <laughs> just based on how you have it set up in... I feel like a lot of hunting is, I mean, there's a bunch of luck involved, there's guesswork involved, and there's what you think is the right way that you've learned And yeah. uh, as far as your experience. And I don't know, I, I love personally the, the scouting and the chasing and the, it, it could change at any point. Someone could take your spot unless you're working yep. harder for it. It, it might yep. take them longer to take your spot, but someone might take it. And at that point, there goes that whole restructuring and you're like, all right, time to hit the books, time to search. And that's the fun part. On some level, it is fun doing that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what makes it um, an experience every time you're out. Yeah. Uh, and, and like I was saying, that if it if it gets to be like the same thing time and time again, well, um, then what I've found, at least for me, is if, if I'm making the same movements time and time again, and I'm getting that lazy in my movements, chances are I'm making that many more mistakes. Um and, and that's something I learned uh, when I switched from being a private land hunter to a, a public land hunter. Um, because the deer, uh, especially deer on, on public land, are a lot more leery than they are on private. And if, if you try to, to do the same routines as what you would do on private land, a lot of times the deer will catch on to you really quickly. Um, and that'll, that'll, that'll change you as a hunter just to, just to begin with right there. Yep. So, yeah, it's really nice to tap into that, that brain power and start to really get those gears started and thinking and start to use your resources and you get into that mode and it's, then it becomes fun. And you can make all of that stuff fun. I'm not saying all of this is like a walk in the park or that you don't have frustrations or angst along the way, but you can you can make things fun. You can give yourself, you know, I went scouting last spring and it was a blast. I brought two buddies with and they they don't get outside a whole lot, you know, like this is what you do. I'm like, yeah, that's how you try to find the trails and you got to look for the turds and let's try to see if we can look at the topo. And it's like, man, this is, this is cool. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yep. um, but that, that brings me to my next, my next setup here is uh, our topic of discussion for the week, which is um, what I'm classifying as hunting homework as, as far as it relates to public land. Cause there's a lot of homework that goes into this and you got to start somewhere. So, I've kind of detailed out what I what I personally would think is a uh, homework uh, to find that spot or that place or that area. Uh, this is not an, an, uh, an ultimate list or anything like that. It's not absolute, so feel free to inter- interject or add uh, things that you might do. But what I typically start with, um, and even having the, the Facebook page for Where to Hunt, is cyber scouting. Um, mm-hmm. Let's look at some maps. Let's get on the DNR site. Let's... You know, start to really, you know, I drive around a lot. I'm I'm out fishing. I'm doing things that, oh, is that public land? Okay, well, let me pull that up on the map when I get home on the computer and let's see what it looks like. Yep. I would yep. I would think that most people typically do and maybe should start there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's point one. Uh, you know, that, that's your, that's your starting point. Uh, and that's generally how I come across most of the places I, I hunt, um, 90% of the places I hunt, I do uh, strictly off of a computer. Um, the scouting, uh, most of the scouting is done off of a computer. Um, you know, just finding the locations is all based off of a computer. Um, and, and the nice thing is, is you know, uh, y- y- you could 
you know, you could spend a lot of time walking public ground and come up with nothing as far as a spot to hunt. But if you spend time on that computer and you find different locations first, you find different places, different locations, uh, you can actually narrow down the scouting time that it takes to, to get in and, and find these locations. Um, for example, um, I normally start out, and I'm, let's just get something understood, I'm, a, I'm an absolute whitetail uh, freak, fanatic, uh, obsessed, you might say. Um, so I spend endless and endless and endless hours on my computer uh, searching through the maps. And, I mean, it's nothing for me to spend a 10-hour day just wasted on my computer um, finding different locations that I should probably check out sometime. Um, and so, um, I mean, you don't have to go to the extent that I do. It's just um, if you're, if you're going to get serious about finding different locations that are going to produce uh, the more time you put into it, the more it'll yield. Um, so, I mean, where I start is I start by going to the DNR website. Uh, there's going to be uh, the the best of the websites that you can use. Um, their boundaries aren't exactly perfect when you go on their maps, but uh, they're pretty close. And um, generally, if you can if you can find a spot that looks halfway decent to you. Um, then you need to start looking at, you know, where are the pinch points going to be? Where are the funnels going to be? Where are the deer going to bed? Where are the deer going to feed? Where are they going to travel to and from their bed? Um, and and then if, if you make a printout of that map, um, then the first thing you've got is you've got these spots marked out on the map. You don't have to walk around on this thousand acres. You've already got four or five different places pinpointed that you can walk right to and check. I gotta imagine you know? someone, someone in your position, as as far as what you do with the, you know, uh, being a wildlife biologist and and managing so much land and and working so much land, you must have a pretty good someone that someone like yourself that would be looking at a map might see it quite a bit different than someone like me. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I, is, I I'm sure I'm sure I do see a few of those, you know, those pinpoints that that stand out maybe a little more than the average person might notice them. Um, and, and I, I, I think part of the reason I have the success I do is because I know how to read a map and I know how to read terrain on a map. Um, terrain on a map to me is everything. Uh, high grounds, you know, if you're hunting marshland, hunting high grounds is, is where you're going to want to check your pinpoints. And if you know how to read a topo or you know how to read a map just simply by the terrain that's on the map, you know, that really helps you, um. You know, and, and, and it doesn't take a, a scientist to do this stuff. No, um, no, or, if you or, don't, and it, doesn't, no. it doesn't take a wildlife biologist either. But, I mean, that I think that's kind of what gives me the edge right now is because there's not enough guys taking enough time to look at those maps and really review um, those different locations. Um, and I, I think that's, that's honestly, I think that's the biggest downfall to, to a lot of public, hand, public land hunters is, they're not doing enough time scouting, and uh, they're not doing enough time scouting from the computer, uh, mainly, because I think there's a lot of guys that'll that'll do their scouting from a computer very shortly. They'll they'll get a map or an idea of a map in their head, and they'll just go out and they'll walk that property. Well, if you do that, you're going to be stumbling around hoping to come across an area, and you just don't ever find that one spot. And and maybe you do, but maybe you don't. But if you don't find it, it's because you just, you, you, and now you've got how many hours lost into it. And, and I mean, it's just, if you do the homework on the computer first, you'll be a lot better off. Um, and, and, and sure, yeah, reading the map can be kind of difficult, but if you're looking for pinch points, funnels, you know, things like that, uh, where rivers bend, cricks bend, um, pinch points at the top of a bluff, pinch points at the bottom of a bluff, you know, things like that. Those are the first places you want to look, uh, and then and then you want to move in from there. But the, the first thing I do is I, 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 I scout out a property by a map on a computer. I print out the map, and I mark out different locations for me to check first. And I think you've touched on something uh, pretty interesting here that, you know, a lot of people get the blinders on 
especially in the state, because our, our state is, you know, we don't have, we, we have enough public land, but when you start talking about other states, you'll find that it's, it's quite a bit less. Um, so to that tune, it's looking for somewhere to hunt. You're, you're literally, literally trying to find a place that you can hunt. So you're looking at the map in terms of, well, where can I go? As opposed to looking at how you're, how you're proposing, which is, okay, now that you've found that, there's another piece to the cyber scouting is spend some time looking at the map you know, to see where the deer would be, could be the bedding areas, the pinch points, you know, the funnels, uh, that kind of stuff, or the food sources, the water sources, start to get a mind for that. And like you said, put your, plot out your spots that you would want to be yep. and then go, don't just go, okay, I can hunt here and then trudge on out there. Like you're saying, cause then you're not doing yourself any favors and you're wasting your own time. <clears throat> yep. Absolutely. Um, and you can spend a lot of time scouting that way. I mean, that's sure. Yeah, no, you know, I've, I've done years, it. <laughs> years, yeah, I mean, years ago, everybody scouted that way. That's how it was done. You know, you just, for the, the invention of computers, most people just picked a property, went out and walked it. With the boots to the, that, to the ground, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and that that's there's nothing wrong with that. But my style of hunting doesn't allow me to have enough time in a day to do that. Yeah, someone, um, someone that knows how to hunt, uh, knows how to read, you know, land and... I think of my dad, you know, he got into technology and by technology I mean computer and a smartphone within the last maybe five to 10 years. And he knows his stuff. A lot of what I've learned with comes from that guy. And suddenly he's got this resource, this computer. He's like, look at these maps, look at the, yeah. the Google earth. Oh my. And he's getting excited. I'm like, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes are big guy. You know, but yeah. that's, that's great for him. Cause then, you know, he, he's taken the perspective of, like you said, everyone used to do it this way, but now look what we have. Yep. So if you couple yep. that together, you're getting you're getting some good results. Hopefully, um, I've done it. I've done it opposite, or, or you know, the reverse. I've been out there and come across spots. I'm like, oh my god, there's deer everywhere. What's going on? And then I'll come back home and look at them. And I'm like, oh, okay, they're coming from here. Okay, good. Right. So I inadvertently found a good spot. Now I, at least I understand what's happening. Maybe I can play the wind direction better or something. Yep, yep. And a lot of times you can you can pinpoint like if you if you got a location figured out that you're going to hunt already. Um, and you know where the deer are coming to and going from, uh, you can kind of, you can map out your hunts entirely um, you, based on the weather conditions and, and so on. If you have a map of that property, you can pinpoint where you need to be sitting on those conditions and where the deer will funnel to. Um, you know, having those or, or aerials or overhead maps, uh, I can't stress enough for the average everyday public hunter it could make all the difference in the world. Yeah. And a lot of people now have, you know, a lot of people are hunting with their smartphones. So you can usually, mm-hmm. some people might pull that up right there right. or save and, it to their but, phone. So they have the image and, and you know, whatever. Right. But. Right. But don't underestimate a phone compared to a computer. Um, the computer will win 10 times, tenfold. Um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with using your phone in the field. Uh, but when you're, when you're researching these properties, um, what I would be doing is I would I would definitely be, be using a computer uh, to do all your research. Um, and the other thing is, is just because you use the DNR's map to necessarily locate a property doesn't necessarily mean you should be using that map to use uh, to use that map um, to, to scout it um, or to, to cyber scout it. Let's say. Um, and the only reason I mention that is because if you do enough research around, you will find better mapping uh, applications. Oh, sure. Yeah, oh, definitely, uh, yeah. And, and there's there's a lot of them that are available for free. Um, and, and it's not necessarily a mapping application that will show you the entire piece of public. Or it's not even something that will show you public at all. But there's other maps out there that will actually give you aerial imagery, pictures taken from an actual airplane of the site. And that will give you a much better layout. Like, for instance, there's a, there's a piece of public down the road from me. I've been hunting it for 14 years. It's one of the closest places. It's one of my best producers. Um, and, and most people that hunt it say, oh, there's no deer in there. There's no deer in there. I can go out there every night and see a deer, but I can mainly go out there every year and get a good opportunity at a monster buck. And the reason is, is because I've done enough research to find the right aerial maps that will give me aerial photos from an airplane 
of this entire marsh system, okay? And by doing that, I can now take these aerial photos, put them on my computer, and look at the different areas of this marsh, and I can actually pinpoint where the major deer trails run through that marsh because that aerial photo you can shows see them. Them. Yeah. yeah, and you won't be able to see them any other way. That's awesome. Right. So that takes you to, to, the, to the point of, okay, now here's a funnel. Here's a pinch point. Here's where the deer are going to bed. Here's where the deer are going to feed. Things like that. I mean, it just... It, it never underestimate the power of a computer because if you've got a good computer at home, that's the best way to scout. When you've got nothing going on, you're sitting on the couch watching a football game on a Sunday, hop on the computer, you know, do some research. I mean, it, it'll, it'll save you a lot of time a field. That's, that's, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware that there were um, aerial photos like that out there. Uh, that's pretty awesome that you've found that. I, and I found other, things in terms of scouting like um a, a lot of different types of conservancy land uh wildlife habitat areas that are up for drawing or, or little little private companies or, or non-profit organizations that buy up private land and offer it out for public there's a lot of other programs that exist other than or outside of the dnr or other programs that exist that are kind of buried in the dnr that aren't going to be brought to the surface you really you got to dig you got to dig and yep. the only way to do that digging, as far as I've found, is the computer and, and talking to people, too. I've found some, some land that I never would have ever found existed by just having a conversation with some people. And they're like, oh, yeah, you got to put in a drawing. And, well, you know, if, we, if your name gets drawn, you can hunt this. And only three people have access to it. And it's, you know, you know X amount of acres. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, but you yep. have to follow some type of some rules and, and be respectful and that kind of stuff. But, I mean, that's great. I mean, you talk about it's still public land. So I think people forget hunting public, there's these other opportunities that exist where there's oh, not yeah. going to be so much pressure. And yep. you got to just dig for them. you got to search. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's there's so many opportunities out there that uh, it's actually pretty tough to keep up with all of them. It is. Um, it is. You know, I mean, there's, uh, there's park systems. Um, park systems generally, uh, each park system will have its own set of rules. Um, you know, and, and some parks are open to hunting. Some parks are not open to hunting. Some parks are open to hunting by permit. Some are hunting open to hunting by permission only. Um, you know, there's there's drawings involved sometimes. Um, and then, you, you know, you mentioned nature conservancies, uh, waterfowl production areas. Um, I mean, you, you, there's just, there's so much out there that um, if, if, if you don't know you're looking for it, um, you might not even notice it. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. Uh, I mean, there's public, uh, you know, all over the state that's posted, and, and a lot of people, um, you know, it might have a different sign on it. It might not say public hunting, um, but it has a sign saying, you know, uh, like, for instance, a waterfall production area, and somebody doesn't understand what that means. Uh, what that means is the DNR has set that property up for waterfall production, but it is open for public hunting. Um, and, and places like that, uh, or, or nature conservancies, or, uh, you know, I mean, just, I, there's just so many opportunities out there for, for people. Uh, and, and, I mean, taking advantage of all of them is, is, is got to be the number one key here. I mean, um, I guess the, the main thing I look at is don't ever look at a map and, and see a piece of property and decide, well, uh, it's not a very big piece or, uh, well, it's probably well known about or just don't assume things like that. Uh, do, do your homework before you make assumptions yep. like that. Um, because a lot of those places, if you're overlooking it, other people have to. Um, so, I mean... You know, I, I can't stress it enough, but there's a lot of opportunities out there. And just take advantage of all of them. You know, try to take it all in and find yourself the best spot and uh, go from there, I guess. Now, but, do you ever do you ever call? Uh, do you ever? Because I know I've heard from quite a few people that um, they'll actually call the DNR. And, and I always get the, the message that if you're going to call the DNR, make sure you're, you've already done a lot of that homework and make sure that you're not yeah. asking them where the, where the deer are. Right. Yeah. I'm not gonna, they're gonna go okay. Uh, um, but I haven't. I haven't. And I've actually wanted to a couple times for some of the land I'm thinking about getting on because it's not the normal run of the mill, you know, managed 
uh, DNR land or whatever, but it is available for hunting. So I, I'm just curious, um, first of all, for any of the listeners out there, if they want to comment in, or if you know you yourself uh, have ever had a conversation with the DNR, and it seems like you would have considering your field. Yeah, um, I've had several conversations with the DNR about different uh, different properties. Uh, what I would say is yes, definitely don't call the DNR asking them where you're going to find deer. Um, they will not give you that kind of information. Um, but they can they can kind of give you an idea. Um, uh, how's the best way to put this? Where okay, um, you know if there's if there's good deer hunting in one spot. Um, you can you can basically kind of you know tread lightly around the the topic of where the deer are, but for the most part, you could ask them um, where where the most uh, deer are being harvested. Uh, simply where the deer numbers are coming from, what what uh, what hunting zones the deer numbers are coming from. Um, you know, you you those are good ways to, to those find questions, high. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're good ways to find high deer density areas because uh, the DNR keeps really good tabs on, on which deer management units are, are taking the most deer and so on. And uh, you can really you can ask them questions about that. Um, you can ask them questions about, uh, you know, government land. You can ask them questions about uh, state land. You can ask them questions about uh, programmed land, uh, granted land, things like that. Uh, and and if you have questions, don't be afraid to call them. I I think that's something people. I I, I really think people are afraid to talk to the DNR, um, and, and there's really nothing to be afraid of because when you call the DNR, uh, you actually get this really nice chef receptionist. Um, you don't actually speak with a game warden or you know one of the tough guys that might write you a ticket in the field for doing something you know, wrong or whatever. You, you're not talking to those people. You're talking to this really nice receptionist lady or maybe he's a gentleman, I don't know. But you're generally just talking to the average people that who, who take phone calls and they're going to do their best to, to find the answers for the questions you ask them. So you never never feel like that's a resource you can't use um, because the DNR, uh, just calling them, if you have questions, just calling them and asking them uh, will we'll save you a lot of trouble. Um, if, if you're looking for certain things like granted lands, uh, government granted lands, so somebody who owns land, it was given a government grant. Um, generally in those situations, those government grant lands are open to public, and those are really, really unknown about, even more than some of the other ones. Um, but uh, they'll, they'll send you, you know, if you have an area in mind, okay, say, deer management unit 76M or something, and you want them to send you maps of the government-granted lands, um, they, they will, uh, because they have to. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, so, and and the other thing is, is you know, and, and I know not very many people want me to talk about this, and but uh, the MFLs and CFLs, uh, Managed Forest Law, um, let's just take them for an example. Um uh, if, if you're looking to hunt some of the MFL ground, the, the biggest thing I can tell you to do is get in touch with that forester for that county. Uh, so let's say, for instance, you're going to hunt in, uh, let's say, Trempolo County, Wisconsin. Uh, you call the state forester for Trempolo County, and uh, you, know, you can use the DNR's website uh, to pinpoint different MFL properties uh, that are listed in their program, and uh, say you come up with uh, a property that you want to take to the next step, you want to actually get maps of that property, get out on that property and check it out, uh, the first thing you need to do, and I, I can't stress this enough, the first thing you need to do is get a hold of that forester, and you need to get the map of that property. Um, because generally, with inside MFL ground, you have open land and you have closed land. Um, with the closed land, uh, you cannot hunt it. You can walk across it to get to the open, but you cannot hunt that. And that map will tell you where that is. And without that, you are trespassing. Yeah, and that's something that so, I, I'm most leery about. And I, I have have here on this uh on my show notes which is you know do we do you call the dnr and then following that is immediately you know scouting the fringes the entry points and the boundaries because 
me personally, I'm very, very cautious. I don't want to be a trespasser. I don't want to get in trouble for trespassing. I don't have that kind of money. I don't want to deal right. with that. I want to right. hunt. You know, I want to hunt. I want to. Right. And I want to be hunting ethically, and I want to be hunting, you know, uh, legally. I don't want to be right. outside of those boundaries. Um, so the information that you're that you're showcasing and providing and bringing into fruition here is uh, extremely relevant and and very important uh, as someone that that as a way that you should be hunting public land. You should be right. aware of your boundaries. You should know where you're going. You know, and furthermore, if your deer runs onto that land, you know, what, what are you going to do then? You know, you have to talk to someone. Right. Can I go get it? What's happening? Right. You know, there's Absolutely. a lot of things you need to know. Yep. And, and you know, I really can't say it enough. Um, you know, when it comes to things like MFL especially, you you got to know the boundaries because uh, I can tell you right now, uh, do, doing my profession as a wildlife management specialist, um, uh, we, we, we do work with landowners who have put their land in the program, uh, and I can tell you right now that most of them aren't very happy with the fact that it's open to public hunting. Um, you know, even if they enrolled it in the open program, they still don't want people there. And that's not, uh, you know, that's really not what the property is intended for, is for landowners to be like that. Um, it, it's to create opportunities for the public land hunters, such as ourselves. Um, and it's unfortunate that the landowners are like that. So they are really, really strict and uh, sometimes very unfriendly about, you know, their properties. And, uh, you know, you, you really want to make sure that if you're going to go on somebody's property, like on an MFL program land, that you're going to want to know where you are supposed to be. And, uh, you know, don't don't make the mistake of wandering onto somebody else's property because it's not going to go over well. No, no, definitely not. And one one thing that uh, that kind of ties into that a, a little bit, and this is slightly off topic, but that's okay. I like we're like I like the I like the topic here that we're talking about. Um, NFL land is a is a tax incentive for private landowners, as I understand, mm-hmm. to allow access for you know, logging and hunt, public hunting and re- and recreating. Um, mm-hmm. Now, there's a similar program that is almost congruent to that. It's called VPA, Voluntary Public Access. Mm-hmm. One of the main differences that I've noticed um, with VPA land is it, it, some of the requirements or, or stipulations is you don't let the landowner know. You don't knock on their door. You don't ask them permission. They've agreed to so many to terms that are already abiding to that. Where you, don't, you don't have to do that. So it actually states on the DNR's website, do not contact these people. Do not try to knock on their door, get in touch with them. You, per this program, you have full access to hunt that land as long as you stay within the signed boundaries. That's absolutely correct. And that is, that program was brought in a few years ago, I believe it was two or three years ago, um, that the program really started to build. And the reason they came up with that program is because of the problems they're having in the MFL and CFL programs uh, with landowners. Um, first off, there's, there's thousands thousands. I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you the exact number of how many MFL and CFL properties there are in the state of Wisconsin. There are so many, I couldn't even keep track of it if I wanted to. No, and it's, yeah, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. The, the yep. Journal Sentinel did a big piece on this, which is where I learned about it um, initially. Yep. And, and the thing about it is, is these guys that have it in that program, uh, there's so many of them that if somebody, say Joe Schmo wants to go hunt on that property, and he calls, he does everything right. He calls the forester, he gets the maps, he, he finds the entrance and exit points, he gets in there, he's on the open MFL, and the landowner confronts him and has this big fight argument with him or discussion and, and tells him, don't you ever come back here and this and that. And the guy goes home and he calls the forester. Well, now the forester has to deal with that. Do you know how many times the forester has to deal with that? I'll bet you it's it's a, it's a number that's ridiculous. Um, so for them, for the foresters to have to take time out of their day to call that landowner, tell them, listen, for you to have your pro- your property in this program, you must allow public access. For him to have to do that, well, it's really taking the time away from what the forester is supposed to be doing. So the government, uh, the DNR, is no longer getting done what they are supposed to be getting done because we have to address with domestic the issue. disputes. Right. Yeah. So we have to address the issue at hand. And so what they did is they went in with that, that new walk in uh, access that you, you mentioned. And, and uh, 
basically it's uh, it, it's it, it's a program to kind of take over the MFL program. I believe is what they what they uh, made that program for, it's because the MFL program has shown flaws, and uh, those flaws are now keeping the, the foresters from doing the work that they are supposed to be doing. Hmm. And uh, there, you know, like I say, this is a problem uh, throughout the state. It's not one county or the other. It's throughout the entire state. Uh, and it's, 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 it's worse than it should be. So um, I think the main reason they came up with those other, the new programs that you've seen um, is to, to kind of take over these MFL programs because I think eventually the MFL program is going to be outdated. Um, it's much like the CFL programs. I don't know if you know a whole lot about them, but the CFL that's program... A crop, that's a crop damage, right? Or yeah, that's, no, okay. it's, a crop, it's, a, it's a crop forest law. So it's, it's the same thing as the MFL, but it's it's more likely to be harvested than the forest law management. Uh, so um, basically, it's the same, the same thing. It's just chances are loggers are going to be in the CFLs more often or more commonly than the MFLs. Um, so, But the, the CFL is the oldest program the state of Wisconsin has in that area. So uh, they went from the CFL... Then they went to the MFL, and now the MFL will be outdated by the new ones, which is the, the one you had mentioned earlier about uh, having, you know, you can walk in on these properties and don't you don't need to contact landowners anymore. Um, on MFL, you don't have to contact landowner. It's not by a law that you have to contact that landowner. It's more like a you courtesy. Have, you should be letting them know it's recommended that you would. Right. It's recommended that you would, but it does not need to be done. They all, they have that property in the program, is listed in the government, uh, the book says, as being open to public. You do not have to talk to them. Uh, and, and to me, I don't. I don't ever talk to them. Uh, I hunt a lot of MFL land. I don't ever, ever, ever talk to landowners. And the reason is because I like to avoid conflict. So uh, generally when I hunt the MFLs, my biggest secret is I hunt them during the week. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's not a bad way to go. Yeah. Now, any of you people yeah. out there that do see conflict, by all means, <laughs> contact the landowner. Right. But right. Most well, people, yeah. I would think, yeah, don't, yeah, you don't want to be running into those situations. That's not fun for anyone. No, no, and, and I mean, it, it really brings down the morale of hunting when you've got a landowner screaming in your face that you can't be there, and you know, gosh darn well, that it's open to public hunting. Yep. And people are always so quick to tell you you can't do something. It's like, where do you? What, what, right. what are you, the fun police? Come on, man. Who, right. yeah. Is it really that big of a deal? What, what's going to happen here? Like, I'm going to go on your yeah. land. I'm going to sit there for four hours. I probably won't see anything. And if I do, I'm going to drag it off your property. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, it's just, it's an unfortunate side to the programs. Um, the DNR just does not have the resources to keep tabs on all landowners around uh, that are, are causing people a hassle. So, um, just keep that in mind when you're if you're going to hunt any of the CFL or MFL properties, um, that the landowner probably lives nearby. The landowner probably keeps a pretty good eye on that place, and um, you know, go in with the idea of okay, if I didn't talk to the landowner, there's a really good chance he's going to confront me, because eventually, chances are it's going to happen. Um, and, and like I say, I don't ever talk to them. I just kind of, I hunt during the week. And not everyone can hunt during the week. But generally, um, you know, I'm in and out uh, before the landowner even knows I was there. That, yeah, um, yeah. If you're getting in there to crack of dawn and you're walking out in the middle of the afternoon when he's off at right. work or whatever, yeah, right. that's cool. So, um, you know, and, and like I say, not everyone can do that. So my advice is um just know in the back of your mind that if you do go in there without talking to the landowner eventually he's probably going to talk to you could you imagine yeah. that conversation if they did catch you after you've been doing it for a year or something i don't want you back there <laughs> well little do you, little do you know i've been back there for a year and a lot of problems it's caused yeah. you huh so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i mean really i you know I, i'm just saying you know i would just uh take that precaution know that in the back of your mind that you know eventually you're gonna have that that conversation probably um, it's probably going to come up. So, um, you know, just to kind of give you a heads up, that's what I would do is just go in knowing that this possibly could happen. 
No, well, that's a that's a good heads up. Um, I had a couple other things I want to touch on, but for the sake of time, if maybe we can just touch on them real quick. Uh, like I said, I don't want to take your whole afternoon away, and and vice versa. I know this is a good time to be out with the weather. I think the temperatures are dropping today too. Today is uh, Saturday the twelfth. So, um, yeah. do you do you as a public land hunter, the DNR just not just it's not like it just happened, but within the last year they've allowed usage of trail cams to stay on on public land overnight and you could always use them but they couldn't stay overnight so uh, i don't know that many people are following that to begin with but uh i i i don't and i've just heard so many horror stories of people just donating their trail cams to other hunters that are on the land and different ways to lock them up and craziness but they're useful so uh, do you use them on public land or or no um you know i have um I have certain places that I've hunted for several years that I know that the public pressure is very, very low. Um, And also in these locations, I am back far enough out of the beaten path that uh, I don't have to concern so much of getting a trail camera stolen, let's say. Um, So let me answer that by saying, yes, I do. Um, I do use trail cameras on public land um, not real often um, if, if I know that there's a good buck using that area and I, I just haven't gotten eyes on them yet um, chances are I might set up a camera in, in one location or another um, to try to just catch a glimpse of them um, one of my rules of thumb uh, last year I got two cameras stolen from me oh man that, uh, that, and sucks. I was, that sucks yeah I mean I was, I was pretty disappointed <laughs> Um, considering it was a, it was a 40 acre parcel, uh, who would have expected on a 40 acre parcel and you pretty much know all the other guys on it, who would expect that one of them guys would steal your camera from you, you know? So, um, it really was kind of a bummer, but the, the biggest thing is, is I realized that if it can be taken, somebody is going to take it. Yeah. So, um, and same goes for tree stands. I know it's, it's against, uh, state law to, uh, leave a tree stand hanging on a property uh, on state land overnight. Um, you know, uh, you know, like the state public lands or whatever. Uh, you know, it's illegal to do that. If you do, understand that chances are somebody else is going to find that stand, and if they do and they can get it, they're going to take it. Um, I've heard too many times of above guys saying on public land they've had their tree stand stolen. Well, first off, you're not supposed to have them there. You know, you can put them up. But you got to take them down. You got to take them out every night. Um, if you are going to leave it up, and that's taking your own risk, understand that somebody is probably going to walk away with it, and that's just that's public hunting. That's yeah, yeah, you got to know these things. Yeah, I've never left a stand and, overnight on public. Well, you know what? I take that back. Um, I think I've done it a, a time or two, <laughs> but uh, more often than not, I, I won't leave it up. And, and more often than not, lately I've been hunting off the ground just because it's a hassle to be on public land and have to put it up and take it down. It's like holy crap. That's a lot of work, you know, and, and for, for what, I mean, I, I can hunt off the ground almost just as successfully, if not more successfully in, in recent years, as well as it, it's safer. Uh, it's well, depending on where you are, if I'm going to be up in the Nicolay, then I, I probably would, the wool population, the bear population, I probably wouldn't want to be on the ground, but right. um, that's just me. I don't know if other hunters would brave that. I'm sure they would, but, mm-hmm. what, but I mean, generally, what I'm seeing is a lot of people don't, they don't realize that if you put up a tree stand, you, you got to take it out. Yes. And, and I mean, okay, now you, you mentioned the Nicolay. Now the Nicolay, for example, I believe, um, I believe the law in that, in that place is you can leave stands up. Um, I'm not, don't quote me on that, but uh, I know some of the bigger, um, some of the bigger state forests. It's so vast. Yeah. Nicolay, it is allowed. Um, um, you know, but you know, again, you, you got to understand that even if it is allowed on those state lands, chances are somebody's going to walk away with it, with it if they find it. Yep. So take the right precautions. Is, is chain it up. Get a get a chain it up. Get a Put a cable on lock on it. Yeah, and that's the main thing. And that now they're making these trail cameras out there that have holes in the side of them that run right through them, and then you can run a cable through it, a cable lock. Um, then they're made by master lock. It's a, it's a really nice locking system. Yeah. There's a, actually, 
Okay. I found one on public land this year. And, really? And, uh, yeah, and I was just curious as to whose it was, so I went over to kind of check it out. And, I, you know, by law, you're supposed to have your name, either your phone number and address, or your customer ID number written on it in yep. a visible site. So I went over, and I just wanted to check it out. And I'll tell you what, that thing was slick as could be, because even if I wanted to take it, there was no way I could have possibly done it. Uh, you know, you, you could take a bolt cutters out there, and good luck cutting through a cable because bolt cutters. Good luck are not, being the guy yeah. walking on the land with bolt cutters too. But right, right, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's just take the right precaution. That's all it comes down to. There's a, a company I found um, just because this topic has been something that's been burning in my in my mind. I don't know because um, I, I really want to get trail cams out there, but I'm not going to stick the money into it. If it's going to get stolen, I just won't. Right. So I found a company out of Green Bay, and I'm hoping to actually get the owner on the show. Uh, we've been in communication a little bit. Um, I'm sure he's a busy guy. But the website that they have is called camlockbox.com, and they fabricate lockboxes for virtually any trail cam that I've ever seen. I, they have a trail. Uh, they have a lockbox for any many, like almost all the major manufacturers and even models. Um and it's a really cool fabricated piece that if it wasn't one that came with what you're talking about, this enables it to do that. So people aren't going to a, get your SD card out of there. They're not going to take it off the tree. It's You can run a cable right through it. Um, a pretty cool setup. So anyone that you know does want to be using them, I, I would check those guys out. I can't say I've used them personally, but from looking at their website, and they I got a couple of YouTube videos on how to, how to set this stuff up. Uh, it yep. seems like a pretty cool product. Yeah, and I mean, take advantage of those options. I mean... I, I can't stress it enough, really. I mean, if, if you're going to put personal property on pr- on public ground, do the right procedures to make sure that you're covered. Um, or your experience is probably going to be pretty pretty poor. Yeah, uh, yeah. What do you think? You're gonna probably happen? going to walk away with a bad opinion of it. And you know, generally, you know, generally speaking, um, I don't think any of us want to impose that bad opinion upon anybody about hunting public ground. Um, you know, as, as public hunters, we kind of need to work together as, as far as, you know, um, keeping this land available for all of us to enjoy. Because um, if we don't, uh, well, the resources will, will, will prove to us that uh, it can be bought up and it can be landlocked and, and it won't be open to any of yep, us anymore. I, I, I can't imagine a world where I can't, like I, we were just, we were talking before the show started and you know, I had mentioned that I, I went hunting uh, just yesterday, and it, deer aside, I needed to just get out in the woods. <laughs> you know, yep. I really needed to. And uh, if that opportunity wasn't available for me, man, that would suck. Mm-hmm. On a different level, that would be, it would be, it would be horrible. It would be bad. Yep. Um, yep. But it's, it's, I think we've covered a lot of ground. We've, we've actually uh, ended up touching on some of the things that I wanted to at the tail end, uh, just through the cyber scouting topic and, and looking at those maps the right way. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Well, you know, just uh, looking at, you know, as far as tr- the trail cam thing goes, I think the biggest misconception public land hunters have is, um, they like, for example, if they put a trail cam on somewhere, they're putting too much emphasis on one property. Um, you know, take, for example, uh, one guy... Uh, say he's got a uh, 3,000 acre marsh, or a, you know maybe it's a 500 acre marsh that's open to public, and it's only a couple miles from his house, and he spends all this time hunting there. Um, let's say, for example, that's what he's doing, uh, and he's putting trail cameras out there, and he's hunting one spot, and he's consistently hunting that same spot. Um, I think one of the biggest problems public land hunters make is hunting the same places over and over and over and getting tied down to one location. Um, when it comes to me, um, I hunt eight different counties. Um, I hunt uh, as many different places as I possibly can. Um, even if I'm in a place one night and it's super good, super good, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to come back the next day. Um, and the reason is because I have better options. Um, if I'm there one night and I see a shooter buck and I have a feeling he'll come back the next day, maybe I'll come back. But really spreading out my time as a hunter um, between different locations is what I think gives me that edge um, over a lot of public land hunters. And the reason is because I keep all of my spots low-pressured. Um, 
So, you know, I might hunt one place two or three days and then completely switch gears and go to a, a county, you know, on the other side of the state and hunt that one for two or three days or hunt areas over there for two or three days. When I'm doing my cyber scouting, um, I pick out, you know, for each county, I split the county into four sections, okay? So I have a northwest, I have a northeast, a southeast, and a southwest, uh, each county. Um, what I'll do in that, in each one of those four sections for each county, I'll pick five or more properties. Now, by choosing five or more different properties, it gives me a selection, okay? So say I'm hunting in Iowa County. Um, I drive out to Iowa County. Say I was planning on hunting in the northeast quadrant. I get there, I get to the first property, one of the five I've selected, and it's full of cars. Okay, well, a lot of times, public land, uh, you know, you're not just going to have deer hunters. You might have duck hunters, you might have pheasant hunters, you might have goose hunters, you might have squirrel hunters. Uh, Those vehicles could be any one of those. It might not be a deer hunter in the whole group. Um, You don't know that. So don't ever rule out the fact that just because there's cars there doesn't mean the hunting is not good. Also, if you pull in there and there's that many cars and say there are people hunting uh, deer, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're sitting in the right spots to begin with. Okay? Uh, what I see a lot is people sitting in the wrong spots on public land. Um, they'll, they'll mosey out on the, into, the, into the timber or out in the marsh or something, and they'll find one good trail that cuts through there and they'll set up on it. And really what they need to be doing is going back past that, finding where the two main trails collide coming out of the bedding area and really be sitting on that. Uh, so, so don't ever take for granted the fact that these people might be there, but they're not sitting in the right spot. Yeah, and people are already, a bad thing you know, on public right. land. You can definitely use that to your advantage. As to exactly. how well you can, is that's, there's degrees to that for sure. But pressure on public land is not a bad thing. If you're hunting a big parcel and it was just you and there's yep. just, I mean, there's me very little movement. Uh, well, maybe not, but there could be quite a bit more movement if people are pushing deer around. Yep. You know, yep. and, that's, and you can use, you can use your bad setups to your advantage. You can use them as your enter and exit routes, because obviously if that guy is sitting there and say you walk in and he's got a tree stand up in the air and uh, you know, that guy's sitting that spot consecutively. Well, chances are the deer already have him patterned. So you might as well walk your trail to his tree stand and then walk from his tree stand to your spot because the deer already know he's going there, so you're not going to mess anything up by doing it. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of options there. But my biggest point is don't tie yourself down to one piece of property and don't overlook them just because there's other people hunting there. Um, again, I hunt eight different counties, and I, I do it cons- consistently, uh, you know, one night I might be hunting in Sauk County. The next night I'm hunting in Iowa. The next night I'm hunting in Crawford. Um, I'm, I'm all over the place. And by doing that, I create opportunities. Um, if you're hunting the same piece of property time and time and time and time again, you're only hunting the deer that are living on that property. That's it. That's all you're hunting. Um, if, if you've made one or more mistakes on that property, the deer know you're hunting them, period. They have already figured it out. They're not, they're not dumb animals. They, they, they're on top of things. They're on top of their surroundings. They know what's going on. So if you've made a mistake, if you bumped them, chances are that buck you're after there, he's done. He's gone. He's, he's not going to come past you. So the best thing to do at that point is shift gears, get off of that piece, get on a new piece, and hunt it. Um, and just keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, I, I don't ever sit... I think I've only sat, uh, so far in this season, I think I've only hunted the same piece of property uh, twice. I think I've only been on the same piece twice. Um, and other than that, it's all been new, different properties. And and, and, and then again, um, I mean, if you think about it, okay, let's say there's a, a deer's home range is a one square mile, and roughly a mature buck is less than half of that. So if you have a one square mile of 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 deer living in that one square mile that are going to be coming through your, your area. Um, if you've messed that one up, you can go to the very next one and you have a whole new piece of a one square mile that you can attract deer or get the deer in or whatever. Um, and it just, you're creating opportunities. The more opportunities you give yourself, the more successful you're going to be as a public land hunter. 
That's a, that's I, a great I, perspective. That's a really, really good perspective. I couldn't have said it better I myself, can, that's for sure. I cannot stress it enough because that's, that's the biggest problem. The number one problem I see is guys are so stuck in their ways of hunting the same tree stand, the same piece of ground, the same buck, that they end up screwing it up early in the year and they never get an opportunity at that deer. Well, one of the biggest factors is, is you're hunting the same piece over and over. You're not letting it alone. Um, and if you've got, if you've got 500 acres or less ground, you do not have the amount of ground you need to, to be able to hunt that often. You don't. Um, one or two times, if you've got, if you've got 500 acres and you've hunted that property more than one, one or two times in a month, you've already screwed it up. Get the deer already patterned you. It's, it's that easy. It's that easy for them. They, they know that you're not supposed to be there. They know that the sound is not right. They know the smell isn't right. They're not going to come through. Get off of that property. Get onto a new one. Get onto a new buck because you're going to create an opportunity there. Every time you jump to a new piece of property, you create an opportunity. And I, I can't stress that enough. I think for me, that's the number one thing I had to learn uh, when I became a public land hunter, especially. And I did this when I was in private land, too, but I had a couple thousand acres to hunt on. So, you know, it was I could hunt every day of my life and never hunt the same stand or the same place twice uh, throughout the season. Um, and, and and keeping that in mind is, is what has has given me that edge to, to be able to get closer to more big deer on public land is the fact that I don't hunt the same places consecutively time and time again. I create those new opportunities by getting out and getting on new pieces and getting on new bucks. And the other thing is, is if, you, if you're one of those guys <coughs> excuse me, that, uh, that um, decided, well, at the beginning of the season, I'm not going to take anything unless it's a 140 or bigger, and you're hunting a piece of property that doesn't have a 140, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you, 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 yeah. you're wasting your time. Well, then you, you want to be out shining, and you want to be out glass, and you want to maybe get the trail cams up, and you want to be doing your exactly. homework. Exactly. That's where the homework but, comes in. But, you know, I mean, if you're going to be one of those guys that say, well, I'm not going to shoot anything smaller than this, then you, you've got to do a little more work. Because 90% 90, 90 of these guys that I meet that are doing that, that are saying, well, I'm not going to shoot it unless it's a 125 or bigger or a 140 or bigger, you know, that's fine. That, there's nothing wrong with that. Setting those goals for yourself is a big part of hunting. However, if you're not hunting a property that holds a deer like that, then you're wasting your time. Get out of there. Um, and, and by, you know, not everyone needs to hunt eight different counties, but I, I enjoy the traveling. I enjoy getting out. I'll travel two, three miles from home or two, three hours from home just to go out and have one good afternoon of hunting. And uh, it's all about the opportunities. Um, I know that, if, I mean, if you know that there's good bucks in that area in the, in the class that you're wanting to take, then you, you might be doing all right. But if you have never seen one on that property or you have never seen one on a neighboring property, you, you, you're chasing a ghost. You know, you are. I mean, it, it, what's what's the point of hunting it if you're not going to be able to take that buck that you're going for? So get out there. Get out there and explore. Get out on some new properties. Don't ever hunt the same ones over and over and over again. You do that, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. And, uh, you know, like I said, that ties back into the trail cameras. If you're going to use trail cameras, you know, you should be using them in the off-season, not during the season so much. I mean, like, yeah, like I say, you're gonna be... I... Yeah. If I haven't if I haven't laid eyes on one yet, then I'll use my trail camera if I know he's there. But if I don't know he's there, I'm not just going to randomly put up a trail camera and hope to God that I, I pick him up or hope that somebody else doesn't you know take the camera. I'm probably going to use it in the off season when I know that that buck is going to be in the summer patterns and I can get to him much easier. Um, so I mean, those are just a few things to think of right there. I just I, I can't stress it enough, but the, the, the main thing I go for as a public land hunter is hunting more ground than the average guy because if you do that, you're creating more opportunities for yourself, and that's that's the number one key for me, and it is. And you, you've, had, ground, you've, you've had, had some better. you've had some successful hunts, so... Yeah, oh yeah, I mean, it seems like every year since I've started being a public land hunter, I have had an opportunity at 140s and bigger, 125s and bigger... I mean, I've, I've had 160s in front of me. I mean, I've got a piece of public, one of my favorites. Um, 
and I, I, I won't disclose the uh, location of it. No, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, there's there's a 200 running around up there with triple beam. I mean, he's got he's got two beams coming out on his left side and a huge palmation on his right side. And I'll bet you he's 20 some different points, but I'll bet you he's pushing 200 inches. And I mean, this is public land. I mean, if you if you don't think it can be done on public land, guess again, it can. The main thing is is getting out and finding enough ground because if you find enough ground, you're going to find enough mature bucks to hunt. If you don't find enough mature bucks to hunt, you're not going to shoot one in that class. It's about as simple as that. If well, the funny thing about that. public land and private land is, you know, you got to think too, private land isn't like its own little bubble. Deer move. Private land, right. deer don't know what's public or private. They could be eating your food plots on private land and then going back to their public land home. You know, Absolutely. it's not to say that you're going to be retaining all those. Obviously, that's the goal when you're on private land, if, if that's what you're doing is managing the land. But, um, you know, it's just we have we have these finite borders and mindsets of what the differences are. But deer are deer. They don't they don't know. You right. Know, so they're going to you might get one on public land. Maybe it was on public land that day or, or whatever. It's part of its routine or it's, you know, where it goes or maybe it's chasing a doe, you know. Yep. And that's that's just that, too, is I mean, uh. When you're doing your cyber scouting, uh, you're scouting on the computer, uh, if you find a piece of public, you need to be checking out your na- the neighbor's property as well because even though you can't hunt it, you can hunt the fringes it contributes, of it. Yeah, it contributes to the, tr- to yep. the traffic of and, the deer. Yep, and so if the deer are funneling off the neighbor's private and funneling onto yours or onto the, the, onto the public there, you, you know, if you can set yourself up on the, one of those funnels, I mean, it's generally a pretty good spot, but... Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely got to take into consideration what the private land is around you, um, because that's going to ultimately it's going to influence how your hunt goes, and it's going to influence the amount of deer traffic. Um, you know, if, if the only cover and bedding is on the private or on the public, and all the food sources are on the on the on the private, um, you can pretty much bet that the deer are bedding on the public, and they're moving down the feed in the private. So you can set up accordingly to that. Um, I mean, just take advantage of all them options. But you know, the main thing is, is like I say, don't uh, don't don't tie yourself down to one property. If you do, you're, you're limiting yourself severely. That's really good advice. That's what I've been actually practicing this season, and so far I've been out twice, and I've been on two different properties. So next time I go, it's going to be somewhere else. Somebody. Right. And I, I mean, for me, I mean, it's sickening. Uh, people look at what my maps look like. I've got over 300 maps over these eight different counties, and some of them I've never even stepped foot on, but they look good. So if I ever got to one of those counties and, you know, say somebody is on one of my hot spots, well, I can shift gears and go to one of these totally new pieces I've never even stepped foot on and maybe create an opportunity that I didn't even know existed. And that's what I, I think the key word you're using here is opportunity. You're creating opportunities, and that's life with anything. Yep. So create some more opportunities just get out there and hunt some new land and, and keep looking for it it's out there and that's part of what this is all about is to connect people and make people aware of either different ideologies or different ways to do things or or literally different places to go through conversation because a lot of the only thing that's missing from everything else we've talked about is talking to other hunters and that's what oh, i yeah. want to bring to the table uh to yeah be honest. so i mean that and that's a big part of it too at least for me um you know and and jared shepherd had kind of he had talked about this a little bit on your last podcast there, but he had mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, some guys will, you know, they'll be the, the last person to tell you about big deer on private land or on public land. And, uh, one of the things is, is, I mean, you can, you can really go, uh, and talk to some landowners roughly around the area. You don't even have to tell them where you're hunting, you know, go out and talk to some of the locals, stop at the, you know, the registration station when deer are rolling in and talk to people get an idea or a feel for where these different deer are coming from. Yeah. I mean, just by sitting at the registration station, you can see some swabs roll in on the back of pickup trucks. Yep. And just by simply asking, hey, where did you get that deer? And he says, well, I shot it on my property. It's over by so-and-so. Well, now you can find a piece of public over there. Well, now you have somewhat, somewhat of something to work off of. Right. Uh, and, I mean, and, the guys, and no one's... Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I, the guys that are that are shooting these on private land, they're not going to be afraid to tell you where they took them because it's private land. But if there's public nearby, it might just hold just as good a deer as what's in the back of that truck. You just you never know until you get out there and you check it out. And, and 
again, I mean, it's, it all comes down to creating opportunities. If, if, if you're not there and you're not jumping from property to property to property, you're hunting the same bucks over and over, and you've already screwed it up, the opportunity isn't there anymore. And I think the so. biggest mis- misconception, too, is people think, like, you're going to get my one spot. Well, no, I, I don't. <laughs> no one has the right spot. That's the miss. No one has the right spot. Someone out there yeah. does. And yeah. and they've worked really hard to get it, and I get that. And that's not what I'm after here. Uh, it's just more or less a, like you said, get a feel for it, get a feel for the area, where where the, might the deer be, and, and do what you got to do. But this is just yeah. another medium of that whole puzzle. There's a lot of pieces here. This is one of those pieces. That's conversation. So. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, your busy schedule, your hunting schedule to talk on the show today. I'd love to have you on again, if you wouldn't mind, maybe some other time going forward. Um, yeah, definitely. It was, it was real good talking with you. We'll have to, I don't know, exchange some stories or, or some drinks or something. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm up for it. I mean, this is Wisconsin, so we got to represent. Exactly. So. <laughs> yep, yep. Keep it safe, but, you know. And by exchange drinks, I mean share them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day. And again, can't thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, it'll be up here pretty soon. So, All right. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Perfect. All right. We'll, we'll catch you later. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right. There you have it. That was our interview of the week um, with Brian Aparizzo of Custom Land Game Services, LLC. Feel free to reach out to him if you have private land and need management of any type. Whether it's getting rid of predation, getting more deer, uh, watering holes, food plots, trail camera setup, you name it, he does it all. And he'll go all over the state of Wisconsin and the surrounding states to help out. Uh, what I did want to get into here to end out this show is a segment that I'm going to be adding called Buck Calls. So that's going to be words from our fans. We're going to call it Buck Calls, cheese it up a little bit. And uh, when I do this segment, you're going to hear this awesome sound. Big Buck. Grunts. So what I'm calling out this week is um, going to be a post that I had created last week about recipes, things that you do or, or love to cook. And I got to say thank you so much, as always, for the participation and the proactivity to help support this thing, where to hunt. Um, but these recipes are amazing. I, I, I'm going to have to post this to the blog. That's going to be where the buck is it.com. You will find everyone's post there. I'm just going to lay it out um, as I have it on, on the page here. But just real quick, I'm going to read off some of the fans, just a couple of them as I see them, uh, recipes for venison meals. And I'm probably going to steal quite a few quite a few of these. We have butterfly loin steak, fry with fresh garlic pepper and real butter. The best. Quote, uh, injected and marinated backstrap wrapped in bacon on the grill. Literally incredible. Uh, friends take it over beef steak. Um, we also have uh, butter, butter filleted back strips with butter and cabbage fried or anything from maplewood meats. Tenderloins in the slow cooker with sautéed onion, green peppers and mushrooms, baby red potatoes and carrots cooked all day on low heat. I mean, these are these meals are mouth watering. Um, there was one in here though too that I had seen um, where people are are boiling the heart. Now I've never even heard of that. I, I'd be curious to try that myself. Um, where are some of these other ones here? The neck roast, put in a crock pot with onion and spices, some water, turn on low and let sit all night long. I think that's probably one of my favorite favorite dishes is just a nice slow cooked stew. And I just kind of make it up as I go. So some of these recipes would be kind of nice to have uh, just to look back on as a reference point and say, oh, man, I'm really hungry. I'm going to try that. Some of these meals sound like they'd be really good after a day in the woods. If you're, you know, it's a winter day in December or, or if you're out bow hunting in January, late season, you know, it, some of these meals are, are, are amazing. Uh, bacon wrapped venison tenderloin, <laughs> uh, a lot of butter and onions. I'm, I'm the same way. I, in fact, two days ago for the Badger game, I'd actually cooked up some, some venison for a buddy of mine. And uh, we did venison and bacon and mushrooms and onions um, with sliced potatoes, all just fried up with some butter. And it was all mixed together, super good. Just cubed up some steaks that I had. It was re- really good. Here's the... Uh, the heart one, heart f- for heart fried in butter and onions with some seasonings put in between two slices of bread. I mean, these these. Thank you, everyone, for for participating and getting in some of these. Uh, we got some good ones too. Budweiser, anybody, anybody? Uh, Budweiser, venison stir fry, chili with ground venison. That's one of my all-time favorites. I probably do that the most. I also done a venison stroganoff um, 
I usually do that when I'm ice fishing. It's just really good to have that nice hearty meal after a day out on the ice. But anyway, I, I'm going to call some of these things out going forward with the show. Um, really want to get a sense of camaraderie and stories and sharing and and things like that so feel free to keep keep sending stuff in and what i wanted to touch on now before we close out the show for the day is how to get in touch with us and uh there's a couple ways you can do that obviously the facebook page is going to be one of the ways um we have facebook.com slash where to hunt wisconsin we also have an email address if you want to send in audio clips i encourage that we'll play them on on the show you can email me at where to hunt wi at gmail.com and that's where and then the number to hunt wi at gmail.com and then um, the blog that I'm going to be participating with a little bit more now that we're doing the show is www obviously World Wide Web where the buck is it dot com and uh, those are the three best ways to get in touch with us if you have any comments, concerns, things you want to add, talk about, bring to the surface, whatever it is you want to do, just send, send stuff in. We'll be happy to um, get it on the show. That said, one more thanks again to everybody for um, your support. Thanks again for Brian, uh, to Brian for being on the show. We couldn't, couldn't thank you enough. Uh, very informative interview. We're definitely going to have you on in the future. Um, and we're going to keep doing these interviews as we go forward. So thanks again, everyone, for listening. And enjoy your week. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, go hunt public land. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.